I'd like to uh, start by stressing the, uh, the title of the talk, um, Illiterate but Literary, uh, comes uh, from uh, a workshop I'll talk about um, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the talk. It was my friend Shantanu Das of King's College London who, who uttered this, this phrase and it was too good uh, not to borrow. Uh, so I want to just thank Shantanu. I, I didn't actually ask his permission to use it, but uh, for coming up with it. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about the book from, from which much of this talk comes, um, Indian Voices of, of the Great War, recently reissued uh, in an Indian edition. It's a collection of about uh, 600 letters written to or from uh, Indian soldiers serving on the Western Front. The letters all passed through uh, a British military censors office uh, in France, and this collection of letters uh, includes letters from uh, soldiers uh, in France to their families in India, letters from families uh, in India uh, to soldiers in France, letters from the wounded uh, soldiers in hospitals in England to their um, families or, or other soldiers in France which came through the, the post office in France, uh, and correspondence between men uh, serving in France who'd been cross-posted uh, from regiments uh, in India. Uh, the only thing all of these letters have in common is that they went through this one uh, post office in France. And so that's essentially what the, is the basis for the, for the, for the book. Now I want to start with a quotation from one of the, uh, the letters uh, in the book. It's from uh, someone we don't know her name. She's the mother of a soldier called, um, uh, called uh, Waris Khan. He was a Punjabi Muslim, probably from what is now Pakistan, uh, and he was killed uh, on the first day of the Battle of Luz uh, on the 25th of September 1915. And she's asking in this letter for the repatriation of her son's body. Uh, and she writes, All your letters have come thrusting fresh spears of grief into my heart. Till this day, I have not regained my senses. The fatal news reached me on the 17th of October. I have written one letter before this to Anwar Khan, telling him to inform all the men uh, of Dara Darabai and Kot Saran from the grief-stricken mother of Waris Khan, that they must ask the CO of the 69th Punjabis, his regiment, for the body of my, my dear uh, only son, for whose sake alone we seven women live, who fell in France. Let his body be quickly sent home, that his grave may be made here, uh, and we may spend the rest of our lives weeping over it. A very moving letter. Now, this letter's been much on my mind uh, recently. Of course, the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Luz was uh, in September, uh, and this woman re received the news of her son's death uh, 100 years ago uh, last month. Almost certainly her request for the repatriation of his body was not granted. It simply wasn't uh, practical. He's probably buried uh, somewhere in France. I want to make just a few observations about this one uh, letter, uh, and, and because a lot of the talk will hang uh, on, on certain issues that this letter raises. Almost certainly the woman was illiterate, uh, so she must have dictated uh, the letter to some local scribe. The letter is a, an example of emotional literacy. It's very uh, uh, moving. It's intended to purge the grief uh, that she's experiencing because of her son's death. It uses a vivid image, thrusting sp fresh spears of grief uh, into my heart. But it's also an example of pragmatic literacy. She's trying to influence others' behaviour. She's trying to achieve uh, an outcome, getting her son's body uh, repatriated. It's also a public document at both ends, at the receiving end and at the uh, sending end. She must have got someone to write this letter down uh, for her, but she knows it's going to become a public document, at least uh, within uh, the regiment. Uh, she says, uh, telling him to inform all the men that they must ask the CO. Uh, so she knows this letter is going to be read out and circulated. And these uh, issues and these themes uh, are common uh, to many of the letters uh, in the collection. Written by illiterate people, they're public uh, documents, they're both pragmatic uh, and uh, emotional. And I'll return to uh, each of these issues at some point uh, in the talk. I've structured the talk, broadly speaking, into, into um, three 
uh, main parts. I'm first going to talk about the, uh, the creation uh, and the provenance of the censorship archive on which uh, the book uh, is based. Um, I'm then going to move on and look at some issues around uh, censorship uh, and literacy. How did illiterate people uh, write letters? How did they deal with the uh, problem of writing under conditions of censorship? Uh, I'm going to try and illustrate some of these with quotations uh, from uh, Indian soldiers' letters. Most of the quotations will come uh, from the book. There are many letters that have not been uh, included. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the reception history of the book, uh, reviews, academic and community reception, uh, and how the letters have been used. Uh, and I'm going to end uh, with some examples of the use of the letters in public uh, and with some reflections uh, about how they might have been translated, which is something I'm, I'm cogitating about at the moment. The book uh, grew out of a monograph about the Indian Army uh, in the 19th and uh, 20th century that I, I wrote or published about 20 years ago. Uh, I think some people in this room will know uh, the history of the Indian Army is a much more fashionable subject now uh, than it was uh, when some of us started working on it all those uh, years ago. Um, when I was working on the monograph, I came across this collection uh, of letters, I came across this censorship archive uh, in uh, the British Library, in the um, Oriental... Uh, um, they keep changing the name, but what up until recently was called the Oriental and India Office uh, Collections. And I wove quotations from soldiers' letters uh, into the monograph in order to illustrate some of my uh, arguments about the importance to the soldiers of the Indian Army of things like honour, religion, uh, caste and warriordom. But I always wanted to follow up with an edition uh, of the letters. I'll just say a little bit about um, the Indian Army. Uh, it was sent uh, to Europe, two infantry and two cavalry divisions uh, were sent to Europe in 1914-1915, uh, most importantly because the Indian Army uh, was the only source uh, of trained troops within uh, the British Empire beyond uh, the, British, uh, the British Army. The Canadian uh, and Australian, the Dominion Armies, were not uh, immediately trained uh, and available. Indian troops fought at all the main battles uh, on the Western Front, 1st Ypres uh, in 1914, and then 2nd Ypres, uh, Neuve Chapelle, uh, Festubert, uh, and Luz, uh, amongst others, uh, in 1915. The letters come from an archive of military censorship, which consists mainly of excerpts uh, from Indian soldiers' letters, which have been translated uh, into in English. The censorship archive had a purpose. It was to gather information about the morale uh, of the troops, it was not primarily, primarily to suppress their correspondence. They, uh, the British authorities were quite keen that Indian soldiers were able to communicate with their families, uh, although the censors did sometimes uh, suppress letters, and I'll come to some of those later on. Similar archives must once uh, have existed for Indian forces in other uh, theatres of war. We know that, that was, there was one uh, in Egypt, probably dealing with uh, the letters of, of soldiers in uh, what is now uh, Iraq and Palestine, I think that archive has now uh, been lost. After a, a year's work uh, in France, the censor made a report uh, on his work, the chief censor, he was one of a team of about half a dozen, and this report contained the following observation. Apart from all present value, the record of extracts taken from the Indian correspondence constitutes a document of some historical value and no less psychological interest. If the publication of selections should ever be permitted, a very entertaining book would result. I couldn't resist this sort of open invitation to produce uh, an edition uh, coming from, of all people, a censor. That, that quotation is towards the end of the introduction to the book, uh, and the full report uh, is in one of the appendices. Now, in editing uh, this collection, uh, there was a number of core questions that I had to address. How much of the collection should I publish? The entire collection uh, is about 4,000 pages. Should I have published all of it? Uh, one option was to digitise the whole thing. Uh, my next-door neighbour in the department at, at Hull, John Palmer, uh, was in the process of digitising the whole of Doomsday Book. Um, and uh, <laughs> he rushed through it in about 30 years. Um, <laughs> Uh, he decided, uh, I decided against that for, for two main reasons. 
partly because there was a, uh, the, center, the censorship report was information gathering, uh, so there was a lot of repetition. Uh, secondly, unlike um, John had a hundred years of, of really serious scholarship on Doomsday to build on. I didn't have anything like the same uh, to go on. Uh, and thirdly, I wanted to use that quotation about an interesting book, so, which meant it had to be one uh, volume. Um, I wrote a, a, an introduction to, to the selection. Um, when I, I did that, um, I read all, all the selection I'd made, 650 odd letters, uh, but I read them again in reverse chronological order uh, to try and see the letters in a a new light, and this slightly strange uh, method does seem to have, uh, have worked. Uh, I also made sure that every one of the letters in the, in the book is referred to by number uh, in uh, the introduction. So you can read the introduction uh, and then read the whole book by referring uh, forwards to uh, the letters. There are also there's lots of cross-references uh, in the book, so you can pick up the book at any point uh, and just keep reading until you get to a cross-reference. I want now to move on uh, to pick up some of the themes that are uh, in the book and in the, in the collection. Uh, first, most obviously, uh, the, one, the theme of censorship. Indian troops knew that their officers, uh, British or Indian, would read their letters, which were sometimes read out uh, before, uh, uh, before one or two officers. This censorship, however, became fairly cursory, uh, um, as officers with the necessary ling linguistic skills uh, were killed. But the main uh, censorship that I'm drawing on uh, was uh, based for most of the war at this uh, post office uh, in Bologna, where all the letters passed through uh, the Indian uh, post office. There was one uh, Indian civil servant assisted by a small team uh, of retired civil servants and Indian Army uh, officers. They read and translated a small selection of the letters uh, each week. There are far too many for them to read them all. But each week they pre prepared a report with attached uh, translated extracts from about 50 or 100 uh, of the letters. The main aim of this censorship was to monitor the morale uh, of the troops and to preempt any problems, particularly around uh, food or uh, religion. Almost all the original letters, I think, must now be lost, but I'll end uh, with uh, one of them that we've found. How did soldiers and their families write their letters? Uh, the census of India uh, showed that 94% of the Indian population uh, was illiterate. A few soldiers might have been literate, such as officers or company clerks, but most soldiers and their families must have used letter writers and letter readers to read and write the letters. And this, of course, affected what the correspondents were prepared to say, since they knew the letters uh, were, it was possible that they might be read uh, aloud. Letters could, however, be privatised by in including instructions to the letter reader, such as, to the person who reads this letter, to my father. It is to be read, read out uh, only uh, to him and alone. The sheer quantity of the correspondence, despite the fact the troops were illiterate, suggests that the letters mattered. In 1915, there were about 20,000 letters a week coming from uh, Indian troops in France, a huge number from four divisions. For most troops, it was the only way they could communicate with their families. One wounded man in hospital in Brighton wrote home, as long as there is life in me, I will worship and love and write. It is my one prayer that you should do likewise. One of the first and most striking features of the letters, unsurprisingly enough, uh, is reaction to the war. There is a river of blood flowing here, wrote one man home. Soldiers started writing to prepare their families uh, for their deaths. One man wrote home, this is a fight of heroes. Men will remember this war all their lives and say that so-and-so died in the German war. By this he means that uh, his, th his family's status as a military family uh, will be enhanced by his death, which he sees uh, as imminent. They also write very pragmatically home letters about what should happen to their pensions when they get killed, uh, and some uh, also write Home, write home urging their families not to enlist because the, the losses uh, are so high. These letters were passed uh, by the censor uh, because he felt that they were simply trying to prevent harm happening to their families rather than uh, expressing disloyalty. There was a great reproach when a soldier learnt that one of his family had joined up. It is a matter for regret that you, he wrote, as a sensible man should put your foot into the blazing fire. In areas where blood, fl 
blood feuds were practiced, some soldiers used the military post as a vehicle for continuing feuds that were going on uh, back home. When a Bataan, for example, learnt that his father had been killed in a feud, he wrote home, if you have any sense of honour, and if you are a real Bataan, then you should take your revenge by killing two enemies quickly, meaning they lose two people for the loss of, the loss of one. This letter would be one that would be suppressed. Incitements to murder were normally uh, suppressed. Uh, but since the, soldier, since the censors are only reading a, a small proportion of the letters, incitements to murder must have got through. There is another side to this picture of, of courage and loyalty, however. Problems of morale did become fairly evident uh, early on in 1914. Um, and soldiers write fa fairly despairing letters, particularly towards the end of the First Battle of Ypres. One man wrote home, the butcher does not let the goat escape, a typical animal uh, image that the, the soldiers uh, often use. Others uh, compared themselves to maggots who are, who are being uh, killed in their, in their thousands. There was some evidence of self-inflicted wounds, uh, and these occasionally surface uh, in the letters, normally in very coded forms, like, I've been wounded in the trigger finger, do not worry about me. What particularly bothered the Indian soldiers in France was the practice of returning wounded men to the front once they had recovered. And there are lots of references to this uh, in uh, the correspondence. One Sikh wrote home to his father, there is no hope that I shall see you again, for we as are as grain that is flung a second time into the oven and life does not come out of it. Meaning once, they, once they've recovered, they're sent back to the trenches and again using this uh, image, this rural image of grain. The soldiers and their families felt that this practice was very uh, unfair uh, for two main reasons. Given the casualties, uh, this meant that uh, a wounded man was likely to be wounded a second time or even killed once he was sent back uh, to the trenches. And secondly, it meant that uh, the policy meant that only, uh, the only wounded men who could return to India were those who had been disabled uh, by wounds and hence uh, economically uh, disadvantaged. In the end, uh, the soldiers uh, in hospital in Britain sent a petition to the king, the king emperor, uh, on this subject in May 1915. The petition was written in Roman Urdu, that is Urdu written in uh, Latin script rather than uh, in, in uh, Persian script, making it easier for the king to read. Uh, actually, it made it more difficult uh, for the censor uh, to translate. And it read, uh, address England, the emperor. Let no one except the king open this. So that showing an awareness uh, that, that these letters are being uh, opened. From the Indian sick in hospital, that's on the envelope. And then uh, inside the letter reads, your majesty's order was that, was that a man who had been wounded once should be allowed to return to India. Or, or if he had recovered, he should not be made to serve again. The heart of India is broken. Any man who comes here wounded is returned thrice and four times to the trenches. Only that man goes to India who has lost an arm, a leg or an eye. Now this act of petitioning was an appeal to and of course a reinforcement of uh, royal authority. The petition is a classic form uh, of pragmatic lit literacy intending to influence the behaviour uh, of others. I think the timing of this petition, uh, May 1915, is also significant. It comes just after the Lahore Division, one of the two Indian infantry divisions, suffered very heavy losses at the Second Battle of Ypres in the last week uh, of April 1915. I'd like to quote now some of the letters written around the time of uh, Second Ypres. Uh, they've been in my mind recently because I've been finishing, putting the finishing touches to a chapter uh, about the Indian Army at, at Second Ypres for a book uh, on the Second Battle of Ypres that's coming out uh, next month for the 100th um, anniversary, at least, of the year, not of the month. It was around this time that rumours began circulating among Indian troops that they were being sacrificed to save British lives. And this uh, rumour crops up in the form uh, of a simple code in a number of the letters. One man writes home, Please do me the favour of letting me know what is the condition of the market for black pepper. That which I brought has all been finished, and some more has been sent. You probably know that there is lots of red pepper, but they want black. In this case, as in others, red pepper um, stands for British troops and black pepper uh, for Indian. 
And this, was a, this idea that Indians were being sacrificed to spare British lives was a potentially pol politically explosive uh, idea because the rumour starts then circulating uh, in India. And I've seen evidence from the National Archives of India of British officials overhearing this rumour in uh, railway carriages in the recruiting grounds. In the, the chapter, among other things, uh, I've looked quite closely at the deployment of British Gurkha and Indian battalions uh, in the Lahore Division at 2nd Ypres, uh, and in detail at the casualties. And I think there's no evidence at all that the Indians were in fact being uh, deliberately uh, sacrificed. Um, soldiers uh, were of course aware of the censorship, and so this uh, collection uh, and the, the use of codes within it is an example of uh, what some scholars have called uh, writing through repression, the use of simple co codes. Rupees are used uh, to stand for casualties uh, and fruit uh, is used to stand uh, for sexual relations with uh, white women. So there's lots of um, talk about ripe fruits and walking through orchards and, and so on. Now these codes are mostly fairly uh, easy for the censors to understand. They take a while to cotton on to the one about fruit. Um, but um, they, the codes could take more uh, sophisticated forms. What you find is Indian writers start working Punjabi proverbs uh, and nursery rhymes uh, into their letters. They include Urdu poetry and sometimes even Persian poetry. Even when the censors can translate these proverbs and this, these poems, uh, they can't understand what exactly uh, the soldiers uh, are driving at. Only people who've been brought up on these poems and proverbs, uh, particularly in the nursery rhymes, could really understand what they mean. I sometimes speculate, could the people receiving the letters actually understand what they meant uh, either? The censors actually admired their, the ability of the soldiers to do this. Um, according to one report by the chief censor, uh, he said, um, Orientals, uh, he observed, using the, the language of the time, excelled in the art of conveying information without saying anything definite, although the news conveyed was exceedingly vague and gave rise to wild r rumours. The men then were not literate, but they were literary, to borrow Chantenu's uh, phrase, and hence the title uh, of the talk. And I think writing under censorship actually stimulated uh, the soldiers' creativity. The letters have many of the qualities uh, that we normally associate with literature, notably apposite and arresting uh, images. I started with thrusting fresh spears of grief into my heart, and I'll talk about some of these when I discuss the reception history of the book. Soldiers might li write a letter in two languages, Urdu and Pashtu, for example, um, thinking that Urdu will be understood by the, the censors because it's the lingua franca of the Indian army, but Pashtu would not. They use veiled or coded language, uh, often flagged by a sign such as, think this over and you will understand it, or think about this, you are an intelligent man. What I've also included in, in the second Ypres chapter are some letters about the Germans and about Indian reactions to the Germans' use of, of gas. as the first time gas had been used on the Western Front in April uh, 1915. There is some admiration in the letters for the fighting power of the German armies. A wounded Sikh writes home, for example, the German king is very powerful. When there is a new invention, it is he who first puts it into place. The English copy it when they see it. The German king is very clever. He is the master. The English are his disciples. Mostly, however, the soldiers are very negative about the Germans, who are often described as rascals, villains, and blackface savages. After Second Ypres and the first use of, of chlorine gas, this theme of barbarism uh, emerges in connection with the breach uh, of international conventions. One man wrote home, look at this German show. They are using, now using poisonous shells and asphyxiating gas. What is to be done when, th when things are done with such malevolence? Our British government must follow their example. The proverb against blackguards, one must be a blackguard, is quite apt here. And of course, the British did retaliate as well at Lewes. Um, one of the things that really emerges from uh, the letters is the cent centrality of religion to Indian soldiers' experience uh, of the war in Europe. The letters are full of religious imagery, references to Kabbalah, uh, for, for example, the, the battle in, in, in Iraq, uh, um, important, to, uh, important to Muslims. And there are many letters asking for religious advice 
uh, how, how, do we survive, how does our religion survive in our sojourn in a foreign land? Or ask, ask, asking for artefacts, um, particularly Qurans uh, and grants, Sikh scriptures. Uh, and a friend of mine in, in Sweden has just won a research grant to um, study the um, charitable work um, which involved donating miniature scriptures to Indian soldiers, particularly by Indian uh, royalty. Pretty uh, difficult thing to research on, I think, and she's got a research assistant. The British authorities were very aware of the importance of religion. They didn't want another Indian mutiny on the, on the pattern of 1857, which was widely perceived as having been caused by uh, British uh, officials giving, and officers giving offence to Indian religion. And they take great care with the provision uh, of religious artefacts, uh, both in the hospitals uh, and uh, at the front. For example, uh, Sikh religious artefacts, metal combs, knives, and so on, were specially made uh, to a, an approved design by a firm of cutlers uh, in Sheffield and then distributed to troops after the census found letters complaining uh, that these artefacts were not available in sufficient numbers at the front. Another uh, issue was uh, the, the involvement of the YMCA uh, in um, distributing uh, notepaper to the troops. Uh, this notepaper had y uh, Young Man's Christian Association uh, symbols uh, on it. Uh, and the census took great trouble uh, to erase any uh, Christian symbols that, um, uh, that appeared on letters uh, as a way of uh, making sure there was no uh, rumours being spread back in India that the men were being converted to Christianity. I said earlier that very few letters were actually suppressed uh, and in the collection it's normally indicated whether a letter had been suppressed or, or not and we can normally speculate why it might have been. The censors were particularly sensitive to derogatory remarks about white people or any indication that caste rules or religious uh, um, observances uh, were not being followed. One of the major themes uh, in the collection is, uh, are the soldiers' uh, reactions to Europe. They, uh, the Indian cavalry stay in Europe, stay in France for three years. They write a lot about uh, European customs uh, uh, and uh, European um, um, learning and so on. Um, I've written about that elsewhere, there's quite a bit about it in the book, but I just will, uh, for reasons of time, I'll just move on uh, to letters about Europe that were suppressed. One of the reasons that sending Indi Indian troops to Europe was controversial was the possibility that they might have intimate con contact with white, woman, white women, which was taboo. Uh, racial, sexual contact between an Indian man and a white woman was normally taboo uh, in India. And we do have some examples of letters of this nature that were suppressed. I love this one. In November 1915, one soldier wrote home, if you want any French women here, there are plenty here. Uh, if you want any French women, there are plenty here, and they are very good looking. If you really want any, I can send one to you in a parcel. <laughs> and this, uh, obviously, uh, becoming very aware of the effectiveness of the, the military postal service, and that one was obviously suppressed. Um, my all-time favourite of these is, however, uh, from a, a Pathan, Turabaz Khan, uh, who's in hospital uh, in Brighton. And he wrote home, This is the woman we get, we have recourse to her. If you like her, let me know, and I will send her. And his letter was suppressed along with its enclosure, which was a cigarette card on which was reproduced a portrait by Sir Joshua Reynolds of Jane Maxwell, Duchess of Gordon. <laughs> which I just love. Um, to travel is not only to leave home, but often to see home in a different light and to reflect on, on home and to reconsider home. And there's many letters about India uh, from the soldiers uh, reflecting on France and reflecting on what they've learned uh, about uh, French life. They give lots of advice to their families. They often compare India rather unfavourably uh, to France. They're amazed by the wealth of France, by the uh, success of French agriculture, and they often uh, are astonished by the fact everybody in France uh, can read and write, and they often write home, uh, urging uh, families to send children uh, to school. Easier said than done, of course, in rural India. I hadn't approached a, a publisher while I was editing the book um, for what seemed to me the obvious reason, not to, not to them, that no publisher would be so mad as to turn it down. I assumed that all I had to do was send the introduction and scholarly apparatus, together with a sample of about 50 letters, uh, and it would be snapped up straight away. Initially, I thought about publishing it with a university press, 
uh, to give it some academic weight, but I got a, a, a series of polite refusals. Um, at this point, um, I was beginning to get rather concerned because I'd spent four years uh, editing the book, uh, and if it wasn't going to appear, then I'd have to answer some rather difficult questions from my uh, head of department and the faculty who'd helped fund the project. So I sent it off to Macmillan, who'd published a monograph on, on the Indian Army, uh, which had come out a few years earlier, uh, and had received good reviews. And they were very enthusiastic about it and wanted to publish it. But that was a very serious relief. Um, now, um, it's come out in a, in a slightly different version. I was going to talk about the, the illustration. On the original Macmillan version, uh, the cover illustration, which I think you're going to do for the National Army Museum thing about this, aren't you? Um, shows cavalry with lances, Indian cavalry with lances in 1917. Simply, I wanted to make the point on the cover. Uh, it's often argued that cavalry had no function on the, on the Western Front after 1914, and this picture uh, shows um, a stage picture, perhaps, but uh, it shows that perhaps they did. Uh, uh, the book came out a while ago now, and I want to say a little bit about how um, it re was received. Um, the book reviews were mostly positive. Um, uh, the Sunday Times uh, ran a review, um, uh, which they, they said they were going to illustrate. They didn't in the end. But the review appeared in the Sunday Times culture section. I just want to focus on one aspect of this review. It's by Patrick French, um, quite a distinguished popular historian of India. He described the collection as important and endlessly fascinating, a sad feast of a book, which uh, obviously we were happy about. But more significantly, he also quoted from one of the letters, and it's one of my favourites in, in the review. Uh, it was written by a wounded soldier in hospital in Britain, reflecting on the fact that once he has recovered, he will have to go back to the trenches. And this, is, this issue crops up again and again, as I suggested. But sadly, he's no longer got the courage uh, to do this. So he writes home uh, in a wonderful image, I am like a man who once burnt is afraid of a glowworm. It's a wonderful image, drawing on the natural world, uh, like uh, so many uh, of these letters. The BBC picked up on the book and turned it into a Radio 4 programme uh, with readings from the letters broadcast on Armistice Day, uh, 1999. Um, they interviewed me and Linda Colley, a much more famous historian uh, than me, uh, and they had actors reading extracts uh, from uh, the letters. Was, I was really impressed by the editing of this because I was interviewed in London and Linda was interviewed in London but on different occasions and when it was all edited it sounded like we were in the same room having a conversation. It was really quite clever. Um, recently, um, um, the, the book has recently come back into, into um, sort of public view in, in certain ways because of course of the 100th anniversary uh, of uh, the First World War and it's re renewed interest in uh, the history of the Indian Army. And I was invited to be part of the congregation at the Service for the Commonwealth uh, held at Glasgow Cathedral on the 4th of August 2014 to commemorate the 100th anniversary uh, of the day the Commonwealth joined the war. The guests included Commonwealth Governors, General and High Commissioners and the service included uh, hymns, uh, Bible readings and poems and readings from Scottish and Commonwealth uh, soldiers' letters. India was represented by the High Commissioner for India, and he read out two uh, extracts from, from the Indian soldiers' letters, both in the, in the book. And these are the two that they, they chose to read out. So I want to talk a little bit about these two extracts, both of which I think uh, leap off the page. I'll read them out uh, and offer some reflections on them. I stress I had no impact at all, uh, no input into the choice of the letters that were read out. The first was from a Punjabi Rajput, a warrior caste, North Indian, writing in January 1915. He wrote home, do not think this is war. This is not war, it is the ending of the world. This is just such a war as was related in the Mahabharata about our forefathers. I'd like to make three observations about that passage. Uh, I'd cited the phrase, this is not uh, war, it is the ending of the world, in my earlier monograph, uh, about the Indian Army. The phrase just leapt out at me. Sir John Keegan, uh, sadly no longer with us, wrote a review of the monograph for the TLS, and then after reviewing the book, he then went on to write his own history of the First World War, and he quoted that letter in his own book about the First World War. Then the people who picked up 
um, put together the, the service in Glasgow picked up on the phrase. So the phrase, the ending of the world, obviously resonates because it's done, in, uh, done for, for three of us in, in completely independent uh, ways. And I think it's important in the service in, in, in Glasgow Cathedral that it resonates particularly in a Christian theological context, even though the author uh, is a Hindu. Secondly, we are, of course, accustomed to thinking of the First World War as ending a world. The war brought about the Russian Revolution and the end of four empires, the Russian, Austro-Hungarian, German and Ottoman. The world really was never going to be the same again. But when we think, normally think of this, we think of it in a European or Middle Eastern context. It's really interesting that a North Indian Rajput makes the same observation and as early as January 1915. And for the soldiers of the Indian Army uh, on the Western Front, the world really was ending. Uh, they suffered. Uh, appalling casualties, as did the British Army as well, of course. And thirdly, when this man tries to convey the enormity of what is happening uh, in Europe uh, back to those uh, in uh, India who have no direct experience of it, he uses an image drawn from classical Indian literature, the Mahabharata. And this was quite common practice amongst uh, Hindu soldiers. And this man was, like most rural Punjabi Rajputs, probably illiterate, but he had literary uh, awareness. The second reading was uh, from a Sikh Soar or, or cavalryman, uh, the second reading in Glasgow. And he write, wrote home, the state of things here is indescribable. There is a conflagration all around and you must imagine it to be like a dry forest in a high wind in the hot weather with abundance of dry grass and straw. No one can extinguish it but God himself. Man can do nothing. What more can I write? Here thousands of lives have been sacrificed. Scratch the ground to a depth of one finger and nothing but corpses will be visible. I'd like to pick up on two things from this extract. The first is the imagery. He uses the image of the forest fire, the conflagration, the dry grass and straw. And again, this is typical of the language that's found in many of the letters. Secondly, he uses the language of sacrifice. It was a letter from a Sikh soldier, but very appropriate for a Christian memorial service. And it echoed the sort of language that was being used at the time in Christian Europe, uh, language of sacrifice. But interestingly, it is not typical of the language used by most Sikhs at the time. Sikhs were much more likely to evoke uh, the warrior traditions uh, of Sikhism. And I'll come on to that. One of the things that struck me about the, the readings in general uh, at the Glasgow service was that at a British religious service of major international importance, five of the readings, St Matthew, St Mark, Thucydides, and two from the Indian soldiers, were translations into English. And I'll come back to the issue of translations about which I've been thinking recently. Interestingly, the letters read out were from a Hindu and a Sikh. There was no letter from a Muslim. There may have been Pakistani officials at the service, I don't know, but Pakistan was not uh, officially represented in the order of service. A striking omission, I thought, given that in 1914, uh, the British Empire, as Winston Churchill was fond of saying, was the greatest Muslim power on earth, and that Punjabi Muslims were the single most numerous class of soldiers represented in the Indian Army in both world wars. So I'd like to rectify this omission and move on to some readings from Muslim soldiers to give an idea of the variety of Muslim responses to the war. The first it's from a Muslim officer writing in December 1914. We don't know his name. This is just after Ottoman Turkey had joined the war, putting in the Indian Army's Muslims into a position where their loyalties were often potentially divided. And he wrote home, what better occasion can I find than this to prove the loyalty of my family to the British government? Turkey, it is true, is a Muslim power, but what has it got to do with us? Turkey is nothing at all to us. Clearly, he's expressing very uh, openly loyalist sentiments and at this early date he probably wouldn't have known about the existence of the Boulogne uh, censorship office but he would have known that his own officers, uh, regimental officers, would have read his letter before it was posted. So there might have been an element of self-censorship there but a language of qualified loyalism is a characteristic Muslim voice in the collection with some uh, significant exceptions. I want to read a second letter now. It's from an elderly Hindustani Muslim uh, to his son uh, serving uh, in France. He writes, uh, Formerly, 
I had experienced but one sorrow, and that was the death of your mother. My childhood and manhood were spent very happily. Now, in my old age, I have had to endure the sorrow of long separation from you, and as a consequence, my eyesight is failing rapidly. It is not fitting that I should dilate on my infirmities, and up to the present time, your brave words, uh, your brave words of comfort and hope have uh, sustained me. But many people like me have, through grief for the loss of their offspring, departed this life. I live in the belief that by the mercy of the pure God, that day will come when my sightless eyes will again um, look upon your face and looking uh, will regain their luster. Very moving uh, letter there from, uh, um, uh, from, from a father. The letter was written in August uh, 1916, fairly typical of the letters that were written uh, by families in the middle period of the war, uh, and even more so in 1917, from families urging their menfolk uh, at the front to come home. It's a very moving and beautiful letter, and we can emphasise with the man's uh, situation. But I think there's more to that letter that moves an English-speaking audience, and I would now like to turn to my attention to the issue of the translations. How good were the translations? Um, I was asked this qu question a few weeks ago at Ilkley uh, Literature Festival, and um, I gave a, an impromptu response, and I've reflected, reflected upon it since. I think the translations were very good. Um, the were probably very good. We don't know. We don't have the originals. Um, it's difficult to say without the originals. But um, and I, I think the, 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 the translators were um, Indian civil servants, Indian army officers with long experience of uh, Indian languages. But I was struck by uh, the phrase, it is not fitting that I should dilate on my infirmities. That is not the English of 1916. It is the English of Shakespeare and the King James Bible. Specific, specifically, it echoes St Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and my brother, an English teacher, suggested it echoes Richard III. Um, I'm descant on my deformities, I think, is, is the echo. Also, the word, uh, use of the word luster, when he, he writes, uh, and looking will regain their luster, I think um, echoes King Lear, echoes the, uh, the scene when, when Gloucester is blinded, out vile jelly. Where is thy luster now? I think the translator here is self-consciously creating an English literary artefact out of an Urdu uh, original, composed by someone who is almost certainly uh, illiterate. That letter has gained in translation. The chief censor, Evelyn Berkeley Howe, born in uh, 1877, uh, an Indian civil servant who, uh, who worked mainly in the Punjab before he, he went to France, he actually went on to publish a volume uh, of translated Urdu poetry, I think in the 1960s, when he must have been uh, fairly, uh, fairly elderly. It's worth remembering that translations can be great literature in their own right. In English, think only of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam or the King James Bible, uh, so much part of our uh, intellectual furniture. As an undergraduate, for example, I had to study Rich Richmond Lattimore's translation uh, of the Odyssey, which is seen as a, a great work of uh, English literature. Now, I want to return to the subject, moving on from translations, return to the subject of Muslim uh, soldiers, just to um, note that it's worth remembering that the first Indian soldier to win the Victoria Cross after Indians uh, became eligible uh, for that award in 1911 uh, was a Muslim, Qudadad Khan, uh, a Baluchi. We don't have letters from him, I believe, but we do have letters from the fourth Indian to win the Victoria Cross, Mir Dust. Uh, he, he, he won his uh, award for bravery at the Second Battle of Ypres, and he's presented with his VC by the King uh, in August 1915. And his reaction uh, is um, remarkable. This is in, in the book. He writes, by the great, great, great kindness of God, the King with his royal hand has given me the decoration of the Victoria Cross. God has been very gracious, very gracious, very gracious, very, 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 very gracious to me. Now I, I do not care. The desire of my heart is accomplished. <laughs> After he received uh, Russian and French decorations, uh, he became the most highly decorated Indian officer in the Indian Army. He'd also uh, received the Indian Order of Merit uh, in 1908, then the highest uh, award for bravery uh, available to an Indian, so effectively uh, his VC was almost a, a VC and bar. 
But even he was ambivalent. He wrote home in another letter, the Victoria Cross is a very fine thing, but this gas gives me no rest. It has done for me. His brother, uh, Mia Must, also a Jamadar, a uh, junior Indian of officer, had earlier deserted in March 1915. He'd gone over to the Germans uh, with 24 troops, and he'd ended up in Kabul with a party of German agents uh, in August uh, 1915, uh, and their plot was to try to bring uh, Afghanistan uh, into the war against India. So very complicated, and I think um, uh, an interesting example of the, of the complexity and ambivalence of some Muslim uh, reactions. The Sikh community has picked up on, on the book in, in several ways. Um, I was asked to give a paper uh, in Sweden uh, to an audience which included um, uh, local, local Sikhs. Um, and in that paper and in the, the book chapter that, that resulted, um, I used uh, this quotation which illustrates um, uh, something about, I think, the warrior values of, of, of the Sikhs. And it describes uh, the death uh, of a Sikh officer. Someone writes home, a wounded soldier, the 47th Sikhs, a, a crack Indian regiment, were charging. The Sahib, the British officer, said, Chur Singh, you are not a Singh, Sikh of Guru Gobind Singh, you who sit in fear inside the trench. Chur Singh was very angry. Chur Singh gave the order to his company to charge. He drew his sword and went forward. A bullet then came from the enemy and hit him in the mouth. So did our brother Chur Singh become a martyr. There are two points I'd make about this letter. Despite the reference to martyrdom, the main emphasis in the Sikh officer's motivation appears to have been warriordom, honour, and identif identification with uh, Gobind Singh, who was the, the military guru. Rather different from the language of sacrifice that was used uh, in uh, the letter from a Sikh soldier read out in Glasgow. Secondly, it's a British officer who, in the first instance, uses this language. He obviously understands what will motivate his colleague to risk uh, his life in battle, that being uh, a Sikh uh, of Guru Gobind Singh is more important than, uh, than dying in battle. I'd like to close with, with two observations. One, uh, a few remarks about a recent exhibition in London. Uh, it was last year, I think, at the Sultan of Brunei's uh, gallery at SOAS. It was called Empire, Faith and War. And it was uh, curated by the British Sikh community. They collected artefacts from families to do with the Sikh experience of the First World War. Uh, and I was asked to give a talk then, and that's when um, Shantanu came up with that, that, that expression, illiterate but literary. But one of the items they'd found was one of the original letters. It was written by, it'd been written by a, a teenage girl, they think, to her father, <coughs> serving at the front. We don't know which front. It was written in Gurmukhi, uh, uh, Punjabi written in the script of the guru, guru and interestingly in the letter she's telling her father uh, she was telling her father that she'd learned to read and write she had done this in order that she could read his letters out to her mother instead of having to rely on a village letter reader so that there was less risk of his letters home becoming subject to village gossip I was very touched both by the idea in the letter uh, and by the fact that one of the originals has been uh, rediscovered. Uh, others may uh, surface. I'd like to end uh, with a dedication of the book, uh, which is, of course, to the Indian soldiers. There was never any doubt, as a Jerseyman, in my mind, uh, what this dedication would be. It was an extract of Norman French medieval poetry written by uh, Maestro Wace, who, like me, uh, was born in Jersey. To medieval scholars, it's a, it's a very famous passage. And many people in Jersey uh, know it too. I, I put it uh, as a dedication, and I deliberately left it untranslated for several reasons. First, of course, poetry is difficult to translate, particularly uh, if, like me, your, your main languages are uh, French, German, and Italian, not medieval <laughs> Anglo-Norman French. Secondly, uh, I wanted it to stand out as the only passage not in English in the book, in a book in which virtually all the letters are translations uh, into English. And thirdly, I wanted to weave a passage of poetry into the book in a language that many readers uh, would not immediately understand, just as the in Indian soldiers had woven poetry into their letters to confuse the censors. I'm not going to try to read it out in medieval Norman French, but I will approximate a translation uh, into English. And it, my translation, probably not very good, uh, reads, uh, everything starts to decline, everything falls, everything dies, everything comes to an end. Unless a scholar puts it in a book, 
It cannot last nor live. Thanks a lot. Mm.